Chet Chat is underwritten by the law offices of John J. Sullivan, the Alex Beard Gallery, and C. Michaels Designs. Hi, I'm Chet Porcho of Chet Porcho Design, and welcome to another episode of Chet Chat. Each month, we bring together local artists and artisans to help a nonprofit that has a special design challenge. This month, we are so happy to introduce you to Kaboom. Kaboom is a nonprofit that helps build playgrounds in our community. And joining us today is Linda Prout, superstar volunteer of Kaboom. Linda, thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm happy to be here, thank you. So tell us about Kaboom and exactly what is Kaboom's mission statement? Okay, Kaboom is a national nonprofit organization and their motto is, every child in America deserves a great playground within walking distance. So what drew you to the cause of playgrounds? Well, when we came back after Katrina, we noticed that there were no children in our neighborhood. Uh, the schools were gone, the library was gone, the playgrounds were gone, but along with this disaster came the opportunity to rebuild things better than they were before. What inspired you to be in 43 bills? You did 43 bills. That's a lot of <laughs> community service. What inspired you to do that? Well, I first became acquainted with Kaboom when I saw a picture in the newspaper of 200 people standing in front of a playground that they had built in one day. And I thought, oh, that must have been so much fun. I'm sorry I missed it. So when I heard about the next build, I just showed up and I've been showing up ever since. <laughs> what was your first build? My first build was at the International School. Mm -hmm. And what part of the build day is the best part of it for you? Uh, I really enjoy lunch because <laughs> It's always something, some good local cooking. We have red beans and rice, jambalaya. Um, the last build I went to was in the Vietnamese community. So we had some homemade Vietnamese food. Uh, I love to work on the children's projects. Mm -hmm. They paint murals, they do mosaic stepping stones. So mm -hmm. I have a good time watching them. And then at the ribbon cutting at the end of the day when the children come out and see the playground that they designed come to life, that's just the best. That's great. Now you're a former teacher. Yes, I am. So why do you feel like the cause of play, for children to play, is so important? I always felt that the best learning and my most important teaching happened on the playground. They learn things like take turns, share, uh, use your words instead of your fists. Mm -hmm. uh, pick things up and put them away when you're finished, include everybody that wants to play, uh, use your imagination, solve problems, and most of all, just have fun. Have fun with it. Mm -hmm. What are your plans for future bills? Do you, are you gonna participate in any more bills? Oh, absolutely. The next build that I know of will be in Palmer Park on June 5th. Oh, that's in my neighborhood. And then I would love to go to Kaboom's 2000th build in Washington, D.C. That also this exciting. June. Yes. So how can communities, how can the community get involved in the Kaboom build? That's the, the most important part of Kaboom. The playgrounds are wonderful, but the work that goes before is such a great community building activity. Mm -hmm. You identify all the assets of the com community, uh, who knows how to cook, who likes to garden, who has artistic ability, who's a leader who knows how to use tools, who has tools, mm -hmm. and all these people come together and in one day you create a playground. I think that's pretty amazing because we really need that in our yes. community. So does Kaboom have a website? They do, it's a wonderful website and all the information that they have about building playgrounds and their side projects such as picnic tables and planter benches and everything that they build the plans are available for free for anybody that would like to do it. Well, Linda, thank you so much for being here today, but most important, thank you for helping build 
really great playgrounds in our community. We greatly appreciate oh, that. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Kaboom works with low-income communities that are child-rich but playground poor. The communities are equal partners in planning and preparation for the day that the playground is erected. The playground is not a gift. It has to be earned. The community pulls together to find volunteers, borrow tools, prepare the site, and get necessary donations for food, table, and a DJ. Kaboom is a genius at making hard work fun. For most playgrounds, the community is required to raise $8,500 in order to prove that local volunteers have the fundraising skills necessary to maintain a playground for years to come. Kaboom waived this requirement in our area because the need is so great. But before the big reveal of the Kaboom Playground, we wanted to talk to someone very special. My next guest is a nationally known artist who lives in New Orleans and who knows a little bit about Kaboom. Alex Beer, thank you so much for being here today with us. Delighted to be here, thank you for having me. So I heard that your uncle is a famous photographer. Was that your introduction into art? Yes and no is the answer. When I was growing up, he lived on our sofa in New York City. And he was either in Africa taking pictures of animals and models, or he was on our sofa. So I'd come home from school at the end of the day, and it was much more interesting to doodle with him and his cohorts than it was to do my math homework, as rudimentary as it may have been at that time. So he introduced me to the idea that you could be an artist. My introduction to being an artist is that when I was first, second grade, something like that, I, I would go to the Natural History Museum, because as I say, I was growing up in Manhattan, mm -hmm. uh, with pencils and, and paper, and I would sketch the totem poles and the stuffed animals and like this. And uh, in fact, the only drawings of mine that I've kept through the entirety of my career are the first two drawings that I made with the intent of having them matted and framed and shown. And I did them when I was six. And one's a buffalo mm -hmm. and one's a totem pole. And they both come from the Natural History Museum and they're still in my studio. So tell me about your medium. And I see you bought this really beautiful piece of art here. Well, it, this is an interesting, an interesting leap off point to talk about the medium because I basically work in two different mediums. I work in oil on canvas or in ink on paper. And this is sort of betwixt and between. This is a, a, a reproduction of a very large oil painting that I made called the Endangered Species List. And I did it for Mountain Film in Telluride last year oh, as their poster and whatever else mm -hmm. they make with the images. Sure. Um, and, then what, and then so the reproduction is what you see in the middle. And then around you can see how it's em embellished. And all of that is, is with quill pen and brushes and ink. Um, I, I, I've always been a, a back and forth between the two. You can accomplish many, many different kinds of things to, if you're changing your medium, obviously. <laughs> right. And I'm just very comfortable with a quill pen and ink. It's a quill pen is extremely versatile uh, and allows for a great variety of line. Um, and the ink itself, if you get to know it, mm -hmm. you can mix it so that it's more like gouache, you can mix it so that it's more like watercolor, and you can do everything in between. So it's a, it's a nice medium. And the oil, of course, is a, is a, is a limitless medium. You know, it's something that uh, the deeper you dig, the more there is to learn. Right? Yes. A lot of people are really familiar with you, the way you actually embellish your, um, your matting. Is that something that came about later on in your career, or is this something that you do with all your pieces of artwork too. <laughs> I'll tell you what it is, is when I, when I have my own galleries, mm -hmm. right? And, and when I first started doing it, when I first decided to hang my shingle, I needed to figure out why would anybody want to buy just a print right. of something that I made? Uh -huh. That, um, you know, what's the difference between buying a Xerox and going and getting a print from me? Right. And, I, and I wanted there to be real value. Uh -huh. So I needed to do something which distinguished myself from everybody else that was on the street that was just selling their prints. And I figured, okay, if you come into my shop and you like what I make, and you like it enough that you want to spend money on it, right. that the least I can do is put a little sweat equity into it to make it special for you. A lot of people are influenced or know you by your kids' art, but you also do other type of art, right? I do, yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, at the end of the day, I suppose I'm a storyteller. Mm -hmm. And one of the stories that I tell, I mean, obviously, it manifests itself in my children's books, uh, clearly. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the stories that I also tell is, a, is the story of the way that things in nature implicitly move. Mm -hmm. So I've traveled a lot in my life and continue to and go to reasonably far-flung places, mm -hmm. often where there are more animals than people. Right. On purpose. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> <laughs> on purpose. <Yeah. laughs> um, and what I found is the farther afield I go, the more 
similarity there is to the way that things move. And the most obvious example that I can think to give you is that if you think about gazelles jumping across the veldt, mm -hmm. they move in the same way that dolphins skim across the surface right. of the water. Mm -hmm. right? So it sort of lends itself into begging this question, why is the spiral in the seashell exactly the same as the spiral in the entirety of our universe? You know, if you look at our universe, the arms of our galaxy is a big spiral. So in hurricanes, we're familiar with those here, so we know right. it's all the same shape. Right. So, um, so the paintings that I make that are not specifically for kids, but just sort of what I'm doing when I'm trying to figure out where does my work fit in the larger continuum of things that are being made, mm -hmm. uh, is into this context of something which I call abstract naturalism. Mm -hmm. And it's about how do you tap in to that universality of that which is the smallest we can imagine to the largest we can imagine and everything in between. That's great, that's pretty brilliant. So you bought some books and some puzzles. Tell us about the books and the puzzles. So the books, and you're in luck today because as of, that's the first copy of the third book of a trilogy that I've written called Tales from the Watering Hole. And this one is called Crocodile's Tears. Mm -hmm. And it won't come out until next Christmas. Um, I currently have out The Jungle Grapevine and Monkey See, Monkey Draw, which are these two guys, mm -hmm. um, and they're episodic. They're parable-based anthropomorphic stories. For kids, obviously, but I have kids, so I know that if the parents don't like them, uh -huh. then they're boring for the parents to read and lose their life. Right. So as a result, <laughs> they're sold to four-year-olds and five-year-olds, but intended for their parents. Gotcha. And uh, it tends to cross uh -huh. over the lines. Obviously, I'm big with the five-year-olds, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not dissing them by any means. but. Uh, uh, and what you and you can see here at the beginning of the first book, there's a map, and it's a composite of places that I've been in Africa. None of them are actually right next to each other, over multiple years and multiple trips. And this lays out where all three of these stories occur. So the first one is a game of telephone, and turtle and bird, and then to elephant and to snake and to crocodile, to flamingos, to gazelle, to lion to hippo and back. Mm -hmm. The second one is monkeys and elephant up in the painted cave, and you can see it here. And the third one is crocodile and rhino down here. And all of these place names are named after friends of mine that I grew up with in East Africa. So there's Mount Kivoy and the Mburu River and the Mbuno Hills and like that. So it's a thing I've concocted out of my imagination. <laughs> to uh, give me a, 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 another means through which I can tell stories. And in this case, whimsical ones, um, uh, and, and I'm, I'm delighted to say that people like them enough that I get to keep writing them. <laughs> Great, I bet you have a very vivid imagination. <laughs> I'm really a pretty boring guy. No, for some day. reason I don't believe that. <laughs> so since we're talking about Kaboom, tell me about the mural that you did for Kaboom. Sure, so I got very lucky and didn't know particularly anything about Kaboom and it was a year and a half after the storm, something like that, and they were building a playground over with the Hornets mm -hmm. uh, and the NBA. It was when the NBA All-Star Game was here, so whatever year that was, um, over at the Mahalia Jackson Center in Center City. And uh, I, I had been in New York, and I was, I was coming back to New Orleans, and I thought it unjust to just return to New Orleans and not do something where there was some contribution to the community. Right. And so I was asked if I would come and do a mural for the center and, and as part of the, the, my pitch to them to let me do it and their pitch to me to have me do it, right. I, I came to do the, the, the building of the playground that day with Kaboom and it was a ton of fun. Now subsequently, I then did the mural and we did it with the kids that were from the community and we, the, the New Orleans Saints actually were big, par big participants in this, I should say. Uh, Rita Benson LeBlanc, uh, who's a, a good friend of mine mm -hmm. and, a, and, a, and a, a great public servant to this town. Um, got Tracy Porter to come down and work with the kids in the making of the mural in the first place, long before the center even opened, uh, and was then a participant in, in helping us uh, raise money through the sales of silk screens during the, 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 the triumphant Super Bowl season. Right. Uh, the proceeds of which then went back to the center as well. So it started with Kaboom. Um, with just going and, and building the playground, it then morphed into painting the mural with Tracy Porter and Rita and the kids from the community, um, and then uh, climaxed with, with the doing of the, the silk screen and raising actual hard cash for the center. So what's next for Alex Beard? You sound like you got a lot going on, but you, I'm sure there's always something else going on, so tell me what's next for you. I got a couple of nexts. The, <laughs> the, the, the first next is I'm about to sit down and write uh, a longer form story about a warthog that I used to know called Olaleggi. Okay. 
which I'm looking forward to, and I'll do that this summer. Um, I'm, the next thing for me is that I'm starting to plan my son's first trip to Africa. And uh, he's about to be six, mm -hmm. and I told him for the, his, the, for his seventh birthday, I would take him with me on one of my trips. Now, easy to say when he's three. Right. Because it's a long time away, and uh -huh. I don't have to th actually think about, oh my God, I gotta bring this kid in the bush. Well, now it's a year away, so I gotta start planning it. So I suppose that's next. <laughs> Writing a story about an old warthog friend of mine and getting my kid to Africa for the first time. Well, I couldn't thank you enough for coming on the Chet Chat Show. I really appreciate it, and I really appreciate what you've done for Kaboom. Oh, uh, well, thank you, and it's delight, as I say, it's really a delight to be here. Thank you. Nice to, nice to see you, too. I'm so excited to bring you a new segment of the Chet Chat Show, where I'd like to talk to you about the new and upcoming trends for this season. The main hot trends for this spring is mixing the outdoors with the indoors and doing this with new and interesting items. By using these, you can make your interior become current and stylish and also a little eclectic. With this trend, it is also important to remember to be eco-friendly and green. Today I'm joined by my good friend, local decorator Bentley Graham. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I heard you just got back from the New York gift market and you found some really great things. I sure did. Tell us all about it. I'm waiting to hear and so is my <laughs> audience. Well, it's always exciting to be there because you get to see all the new artisans and see what they're coming up with. It's going to be new and fresh. Right. One of the things that I found that I thought was like really great is this company is making news, uh, um, recycled newspaper into things we use around the home. For example, pillows or placemats. I just think those are really great. And not only that, they make personal items too, like this amazing wallet that oh, I have. I love that. Because you know, a great? big part of the Chet Chat Show is we talk about recycle, upcycle, and kind of doing it yourself. Absolutely. Now, this is something that this company does, but could you think this is like a modern version of decoupage? You think somebody, if they really tried, they could probably do this? They might be able to. I'm not sure what the process is that they use to, um, to coat the, um, the the newspaper, but it's possible that you could um, coat the newspaper yourself and try it. Uh, I think that they've probably come up with a system that really um, stands up to the, the use and abuse, for example. And the other thing that I love that they do, for example, with the placemats, they use food. I mean, placemats, food. I mean, it goes along with whatever you want it to do. And I think that they also would do um, custom work. If you said, I'd like it to have whatever, I know for the wallet, I asked them, that I wanted it to say New York Times, and right. they made mine to say New York Times. Well, this is brilliant. What is this? I'm excited about this. This is a really, this is a great company too. I love this stuff. They're, um, they're napkins and placemats and, um, and cocktail napkins. They come on these rolls. Um, I don't think that we have one out, but they're, um, they come like on a roll of, um, uh, paper towels. Paper towels, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. In all of these different sizes. And you tear them off. They're really unique. They're all cotton. They mm -hmm. can be reused uh, up to five or six times. And um, they're just, I think it's sort of a, f a fantastic new trend. They come in a lot of really great colors, as you see. Um, you know, even if you have something that's very neutral at your home, you can always use a color to sort of spruce up the um, your your neutral colors or come up with something that's going to go with a, a party theme. I think this is brilliant. This is disposable really is. linen napkins. They are disposable. I, they can be disposed, or like I said, you can actually wash them and use them up to five times, five or I, six times. I love this. I'm going to get some of these from my house. They're what great. are these beautiful books that you bought here? Um, these are um, by a company that take, t uh, takes old books and gold leafs the um, edges and puts on these beautiful covers. Um, these are real books? These are real books that they take and um, and just make decorative. Uh, they come oh, in the real books. Yeah, no, they're they're real books that they've they've, they've taken and um, and put the gold leaf and the silver leaf edges on and the the decorative um, fronts and backs. So this is a great way to enhance a bookshelf, it or would be. or if you had a coffee table and you just wanted to add, you know, some type of absolutely. Um, work to it, this would be really, really great. It would be, you could even sort of like, for example, this sort of next thing that we're gonna talk about, if you just wanted something to sort of like stack it up with, it yeah. just sort of makes a, you know, it makes a, a nice statement.
And what is this beautiful piece of glass we have here? Recycled glass that this company is doing. You know, terrariums sort of come in and out of fashion, mm -hmm. and um, they're currently back in again. Really? And, but that's, you with know, any, that's with anything, right? It goes in, exactly. goes out. Exactly. And, I, you know, they've, they've done a sort of modern take on it, I uh -huh. think, with, with uh, you know, this one sits on its side. It has sort of, a, I think, a sort of more contemporary sort of look to it. Um, and, you know, whether or not you, like we've done here, we've put an air plant inside uh -huh. here. And what do we have back here? Well, here we have these, um, this company does these beautiful vases. And again, the, um, the thing with these is they have an organic sort of feel to yeah. it. You know, they have the look of natural object, you know, natural things you would find in nature. Um, the the shape the shapes the, are amazing and the textures uh -huh. and they're just you know they almost look like you know they've been carved out of wood right. and they come in a, an array of sizes and they're also sort of beautiful and instead of, without being too um, you know too crazy and out there they're very accessible and they're you know they're easy for anyone to use in any sort of a decor whether it's a more traditional or more contemporary these would fit right in beautiful beautiful colors very natural again bringing the outside in yeah that's important this season it really and this is. beautiful piece of wood here it almost looks like it could be a stool or a table it could be either I mean honestly you know all you have to do is think a little bit outside the box mm -hmm. uh, this company uh, takes um, old pieces of wood and um, upcycles it or recycles it depending on sort of you know your your choice of right. terms uh -huh. these days um, I think that it all kind of means the same, same thing, thing to some degree so. but um, they you know they just take um, uh, reclaimed wood mm -hmm. and carve it into these beautiful tables and you know you're se you're seeing a lot of that I mean when we were in New York we saw a lot of that those were the trends uh -huh. that there would be lots of companies that were taking whether it was the newspaper right. or old pieces of wood or the recycled glass or the books and sort of in incorporating them into things that we can use currently. A lot of pe times people just don't have time to do it themselves, even though that you, you, you know, we all say, oh, well, you know, we, we want to try that. You know, if you think that you do and you don't think you can accomplish it, you can always go out and find it. I agree. Bentley, this has been a pleasure. This is really fun stuff. I appreciate you coming and bringing all these hot trends that you found Absolutely. at Market. Well, there was one other thing I wanted to mention. We found this really great company that makes recycled leather. I know you think recycled leather uh -huh. is a crazy thing. Look for it. It's an amazing thing. It's beautiful. Well, Made great. in Italy. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So guys, for more of these segments, Bentley is going to be doing a guest blog on my website. If you go to ChetPorscheDesign.com and you click on the blog, Bentley will be guest blogging. He'll tell you all about all these items that we've shown you today with price points and where you can find these. Once again, Bentley, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. We've enjoyed it. This me. is really fun. Great. Thanks. Guys, this is the part of the Chet Chat segment that I love. It's the DIY, the do-it-yourself segment. And I'm sure you're familiar with faux finishing and decorative painting. Well, for the most part, when we think of faux finishing, we think about our walls, not realizing many of the decorative items we utilize in our home actually are faux finished, from kitchen cabinets to accents, mirrors, and so forth. I'm joined today by local artist Corey Michael. Hey, Chad. Corey, it's a pleasure to have you Same here. I'm here. Glad to be here. Glad so actually, here. tell me about Corey Michael and Corey Michael Design. Well, we uh, specialize, Chet, in architectural finishes on your walls, three-dimensional architectural finishes for your walls, and decorative and faux finishing for your walls, and also furniture, kitchen cabinetry, and home accents. So this is a do-it-yourself DIY segment. It so, is. So you bought some fun stuff for us to yes. actually do. Do. So start it off. Tell us exactly okay. what we're going to do here today. Well, basically today we're going to, I bought some furniture along with me here for this you to amazing. check out. This is amazing. This is beautiful. Really nice. We just added some texture in there. And uh, as you mentioned in your Hot Topics previously, that, uh, you know, the uh, silver leafing is really trending now. So it's big now. Perfect. I'm glad that I brought it. Yes. Okay. So uh, basically we're going to show you how to do this. Okay. Okay. It's really easy. It's really quick. And most importantly, it's inexpensive. We achieve this finish by using a joint compound, uh, silver leaf, you need a little spray adhesive, and you need some clear gloss. Okay, okay. So, so what's our first step? Our first step is to base coat whatever the item is in the joint compound. So you just want to dip it in the joint compound. This is not And this is special. joint compound, which you can find anywhere? Or? Anywhere. Lowe's, Home okay. Depot. And it's a good price on that? I don't want to talk about 
about something that's too expensive. This is something that's it's really affordable. It's basically about $10 for about five gallons of perfect, this stuff. So perfect, perfect. We love this, okay. okay, joint compound. So you just want to get that on there. It's no special way to do it, but you do want to give it a striated effect. So you want to give it a directional pull. Here, you want to try sure, that Sure, absolutely. Bit? Is Great. it that easy? It's that easy, Chad. I mean, even you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, good, that's good. So okay. you're just pulling it back and forth, basically? Exactly. Okay, and I'll then, let the professional handle that hey, after give that? It, let, I'll go right at it. Okay. So uh, once you have that done, we have a dry section here, right? Okay. Okay, so once it's dry, you want to come back with another coat of the uh, joint compound. But you have to let this dry for how long, Corey? You have to let it set. It usually takes about three to four hours okay. to dry. So you, you put can, the first coat on, then you let it set for three to four hours, and then you apply the second coat of joint compound. You apply a second coat of jo joint compound, but you want to kind of let the joint compound fall mm -hmm. onto the surface, leaving pits and skips. Let it miss. Okay. If it misses, just keep going. Don't try to make it perfect. And because there is no wrong or right way, there right? There is no wrong or right way. You just want to keep it in that directional pull. Okay. Vertical poles, just like that, okay? Oh, that's how and you that's get that And that's going to create that texture. Uh -huh. Once that's dry, we have that here, mm -hmm. it's going to look like this, okay? okay. You're going to take your sandpaper, 220 grit should be okay. good. You want to give it a light sanding, okay? And that's okay. going to keep it from knocking away. It's going to actually help it to stay firm and secure onto whatever your substrate okay. is, okay? okay? So once you have that done, it's sanded down. You want to brush it off, get all of that dust out of there. Okay. And so the second time you... First, the first section of it, you actually put the joint compound on. You let it dry for three to four hours. Exactly. Then you apply the joint compound the second time with yes. the same amount of drying time, three to four hours? Yeah, the same amount of drying time because it's going to actually dry quicker since you're putting compound onto an already dry compound. So it may even dry in less than that time. Okay, so once good. that's done, then you transition to this. You'll be here. Uh -huh. You give it a light sanding with the two, 220 okay. grit sandpaper. Uh -huh. Sand it up. You want to dust it off, okay. get all the dust out of there, and then we'll get to the silver leafing. It's very simple. You just get a silver leafing spray adhesive. You mm -hmm. can find that at any craft store. You want to just give it a light spray on. Uh -huh. It's just a very light spray. You want to spray the entire area, and then you begin to apply your silver leaf. And these are silver leaf, see, silver leaf sheets that you can basically buy anywhere, right? Any craft shop or art supply store should have silver leaf. They're in very it. fragile, so I'm going to let you handle that. Okay. You want to put one on and yeah. That's how it's, we do it's it. Very, it's, it's very, it, well, the silver leaf is very, very light. So, uh -huh. you know, you have to be, it's kind of tedious. But with this, you don't have to be so neat. You just want to get it on. It binds into itself, uh -huh. you know, so you don't have to be neat about it. I mean, after working with it, you'll figure out a way to be a bit neat uh -huh. to save on the silver leaf. But for this project, it's fine. You just want to get it on there, cover it up, uh -huh. just like that. And uh, once you have the entire area covered, then you want to burnish the silver leaf onto the oh, surface. That's beautiful. And it's going to just break away uh -huh. wherever it's not, no, where there's no adhesive, and uh -huh. you get something that looks like this. Which looks like this. And as well here. As that. Okay, so uh -huh. once you're here, you want to just take a clear glossy coat, uh -huh. and you want to give it a light spray. It's protected, and you're pretty much all set to go. I love it. That's, That's it. really easy. Isn't but you it cool? all, it's great. It's yeah. beautiful. But you also bought some of your other work that yes. you showed us some different type of finishes that is not silver leaf. So let's look at a couple of those. Sure, sure. This Tell is me a, about this is gorgeous. This is a, a, a luster stone wall treatment. This is actually applied to your wall. It's a three dimensional architectural finish. Uh -huh. And um, very nice. We call this uh, chocolate bar. Beautiful. Okay, so you can check that out. And uh -huh. I brought this because this is really cool because it actually ties right into what we just showed. This is actually wow. the same process, but just taking a few steps farther, uh -huh. you know what I mean? But it's the same exact process. You want to lay that plaster in, create the design, and uh, there you have it. It has a pearl finish, but this is done on a wall, but it also applies to your furniture. This is a do-it-yourself? You think I could do this? This is a quick do Chet, even you can do it, man. <laughs> Okay. Corey, these things are beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us today Absolutely. with this DIY segment. Anytime, Chet. This is really fun. I'm really excited. Now that we have all the parts, we're ready for our big reveal. And that's it for Chet Chat. Thank you for joining us and learning more about the Kaboom Playground. For more information on today's show, you can visit my website at ChetPoreShowDesign.com. 
I'm Chet Porcho, and I have design for you, New Orleans. See you guys next time. Chet Chat is underwritten by the law offices of John J. Sullivan, the Alex Beard Gallery, and C. Michaels Designs.